Find your Bible. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. And so let's, let's begin in, in 1 Corinthians. We will, we will end in 1 Peter. And this is really a, an application message. To some degree, because I couldn't get in what I wanted to get in, and I knew I wouldn't be able to. Uh, last week, we wanted to have a time where we could talk some application about real life and the implication of Christ's resurrection on the life that we struggle with now. And so, I want us to pray now, and I, I want you to be grateful, because I didn't plan this message around the coronavirus. We planned this message uh, months in advance as me and Micah thought about the, the struggles uh, of real life and how the resurrection applies to that. And so I want you to feel the love of God for you this morning as you sit in your room trapped, that the Lord cares about depression and the resurrected life has something to say to that. So let's pray for each other and with each other. Lord, as we come here with our Bibles open, but we are unable to get together, and yet, Lord, we are able not only to reach to gather through take family and our friends here, but, Lord, even those beyond our normal people who gather through technology, we give you thanks for that, and uh, I, thank you. I thank you that you care about those who struggle with depression, those who are anxious right now. Those who are stir-crazy right now, those who feel overwhelmed right now, you care. And so you and your sovereign providence planned on us preaching this message right now. We thank you for that. We couldn't have planned that. And we thank you that we don't have to worry about those things. You are the God of the details because you love us personally. And we thank you for that now. So speak to us through your word, Lord. Give us things that we can put into our lives to help us with the life that we live now and the situation that we find ourselves in now. We ask you for your mercy today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week, here was our main idea. The Christian faith and the future of Christians rest on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're saying the faith and your faith rest on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Your present your past and your future all hinge on that, whether you realize it or not. 1 Corinthians 15, do you remember that? If you got your Bibles, let's remind where we have been. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. This is what we call the faith. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And if you remember, Paul goes on to say in verse 12 to 19 that if this is not true, we are hopeless, we are pitiful, we are pathetic, we are wasting our time. And yet in verse 20, look down at that, he says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So he has risen. And so we have hope. We looked at that last week. We talked last week about our future glory and our future living. We read some texts about the new heaven and the new earth. And yet, we are all plagued in, with that question. If you didn't ask it last week, you've probably asked it this week. But yeah, but what about now? You know, we're living in this right now. What about now? What does the resurrection of Jesus have to say about that? How can we... Fight for a living hope right now. So that's what we wanted to talk about. And so now, with that being said, let's go to our application verse, 1 Peter 1. We introduced this last week. 1 Peter 1 and verse 3. Let me just say, as you turn here, this was written to people who were newly saved and not only was suffering, but more suffering was coming. So trials were there. Trials were intensifying. The writer of this, according to our church fathers, was crucified upside down by those who were persecuting the church. So he knew what he was talking about. And, uh, and so he writes this to the church, 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 3. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And this you rejoice, though now for a little while... If necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes through it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is God's word. And so as we think about that, let us contrast this hope with Karl Marx and his socialist Marxism. And here was what he had to say about his system in comparison to what he called religion. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of the heartless world, and the soul of the soulless condition. It is the opium of the people. You've probably heard this said more concise, that religion is the opium of the oppressed. It is the opium of the common man. It is, as we would say in our normal culture, it is your crutch if you need it. It is your pill that does not fix the problem but makes you feel better because it dulls your senses. And so we return to Paul's argument. If Jesus Christ is not alive, then Karl Marx was right. Because we have a a hope with with no substance. We need a hope of substance. Something that is real, that is living, that's true, that is immovable. Let's think about it this way. We're all stuck at home. And I confess, I've looked at Facebook more over the last week than I have in five years, you know. (laughs) We are doing more relationships and communications on, on social media than we ever have. And we're grateful for it. But I ask you a real question. Which would you rather have, 500 virtual friends or one genuine friend of substance. I'm talking about your two o'clock in the morning friend, your friend that's there, that's with you, that knows what your breath smells like in the morning and how grouchy you get when you don't eat at 12 o'clock and loves you anyway, that friend. Would you trade that friend for 500 virtual friends? Do we not know this intrinsically that we need something of substance? This is what we are saying as Christians. Jesus Christ is our living hope. He is our substance, capital S. So then, why do I struggle with depression and anxiety? And what can we do about it? Follow my illustration here. Life is sort of like going on a hike. Don't always know what you're going to go through, but you pack your bag, don't you? So let's think about this. Sort of metaphorically, let's unpack our backpack now. This morning as you're sitting in your den, unpack your backpack. If you're going on a hike, what would your clothes look like? What would be in your bag? Unpack it in your mind. Unpack it. What's there? What did you plan for? Did you plan? Did you pack flip-flops? Are you about to put on flip-flops to go for a hike? Or how about tennis shoes? Or are you not planning on putting on something For your feet that will help you not only hike flat, but also hike the hills and the valleys. How about if it rains or if it's cold? What are you going to do if you sprain your ankle along the way? This is life. It is. This is life. Sometimes we fall. Sometimes we sprain our ankle. But we need to plan for that. What What are we going to ensure our survival if that happens? Life is like that. It's like a long hike. And God knows what the trail is. But he's not telling you specifically what it looks like. Many of us 
This hike is filled with times of anxiety and depression. So, Pastor, do you struggle with depression? I do. And for many of us, this is real life. Not only many of us, many of those people that, that, that are heroes of our faith struggled with depression in their actual life. Sometimes this depression comes on us like a thunderstorm in our hike. And sometimes it feels like we just went through an avalanche. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, one of my heroes, struggled with depression. And he, called, he said this about it. He said, fighting this type of depression is as difficult as fighting with mist. It's like trying to get in a fight with a misting ring and trying, to, and trying to beat it. He said, that's what it's like. So how can we fight with hope? I, I'm not here to give you a pill. I have no opium this morning. Depression is real. Depression is painful. Anxiety that you feel right now is not an illusion, is it? It's real. So I want to flip my cards over from the start with because this text is so clear from the moment you were born again. You live by faith. Life is lived by faith. This is your primary weapon in this fight. If you are saved, it's in your backpack. It's there. Why? Because you put it there? No, because God did. He put it in our backpacks. Faith, you would not be saved if he had not given it to you. My concern today, for not only you, but us, for myself, I am simply, this message is simply something that I am applying and have applied in my own life. I am concerned that when you listen to the radio for encouragement, they, they try to build your personal faith, but you have not spent any time studying the faith. We do not have faith in our faith. We have faith in Jesus Christ. He is the substance of that which we trust. Why? Because you and me are notoriously unreliable. Your personal faith ebbs and flows. It changes. Christ does not change. So we see the battle. And I hope you even get a glimpse of the purpose those in, first, those in Asia Minor that Peter wrote to were struggling with the same things that we have. So what can we learn today by way of application? Well, I hope you can see today that Jesus gives us both a living hope. And listen, this is important. We'll talk about this. Inexpressible joy and the living hope in the midst of it. I'm not telling you God's going to remove that which you're going through. I cannot. He is sovereign. I am not. The resurrected life of Jesus gives us a living hope in the midst of depression. His hope is living. Look at now at 1 Peter. Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I like this in the translation. Exclamation point. Tells you how he's, how he's, when he's, what he's like, what he's doing when he's writing this. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Notice our one of our first tools that has to go in our backpack to fight depression is right here in front of us. It's all we're doing is picking things on the surface today of this text. What is he doing when he's writing this? He's blessing the Father of Jesus Christ. You see that? How can we fight for hope in the midst of re resurrected and live a rested resurrected life? We worship. This is, what we, this is why we are missing gathering together so much. Brothers and sisters, this is even more important because you are locked up inside your house. And listen, this may get more intense before it gets better. How can we fight? What tools must be in our backpack? We must worship. This is what he is saying, but what do we worship? How do we worship in the midst of depression? As I go on, listen, I know how hard this is, but this is truth today. Let's put it in our backpacks. We need to praise God for his sovereign gift of salvation through Jesus Christ by faith. This is what he is putting. This is right on the surface. Do you see it? Blessed be the God. He has, we have been born again. I love Ephesians 1. It points to our past salvation. 
it says in Ephesians 1 verse 4 that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world and he did it in love. Hebrews 6 19 just listen to this one this is our present confidence of our salvation we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of our soul a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain this is not only a past confidence that we have been chosen in love but it is a present confidence that when Christ died he anchored us to himself we praise him for that if you got your Bibles, turn with me to James. You ever wonder why I spent a whole message simply doing application? James wrote a whole book of application. His whole book's telling us how to apply. And why don't we apply what we, our own faith? James 1.17 says it this way. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Verse 18, of his own will, he brought us forth, there's that new birth, brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And so we, we see here, we, we can praise God even in the midst of confidence for our past salvation, our present salvation, and every good thing that comes to us. We have to do this. We need to worship. We need to praise God not only for our our salvation. We can praise Him for our future inheritance. Look as He continues in verse 3 and 5. He said we've been born again to a living hope. The end of verse 3. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Look at verse 4. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you goes on to say, it's almost redundant, but it's a beautiful redundancy. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed. We can praise Him because we have a future inheritance that is kept for us. That word kept means guarded. It means protective. It is in language the sovereign passive. God is doing it. You're not guarding your inheritance. He is. So in the midst of our depression, we need to remind ourselves, we need to praise God with our minds and with our mouths that we have been saved. We have an inheritance. Ephesians 1 and verse 13 and 14 says the very Holy Spirit that you have and I have is a guarantee of that. It says, in him you also, when you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, and believed in him, were sealed With the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. What is that inheritance? I mean, when I'm praising him and when I'm praising him for our inheritance, like what exactly are you praising him for? See, it's important to know what you're saying when you say what you're saying and when we worship. We're not trying to mystically drum ourselves up here. We are actually praising Him for something that God has promised. So what is it? It is the full and final deliverance from the curse of sin, and it's a debilitating effect in your life, yes, including depression. That's what we long for. That's what you're praising God for when you praise Him for your inheritance. There is one day coming when I will be in perfect holiness in the presence of my Lord. That's a promise. It is final salvation realized physically and spiritually. David longed for that. Yes, David was a man after God's own heart that struggled with depression. You don't believe it, read Psalms 42 and 43. Psalms 42, he says this, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? You see, he lived with that longing. And he realized it was coming. You see, right now, what we're experiencing, what you're experiencing, what we're all experiencing is something right now that exists, that keeps us from doing what we want to do. You see, that's what causes anxiety. 
Something is, something is controlling you. It's controlling us. We cannot gather as we want to. We cannot do things that we normally do. We have a stay-at-home order in effect. Here's what we're praising God for in the midst of that. There is coming a day to when there will be nothing that exists to keep us from worshiping our Lord in spirit and in truth. Nothing will ever physically or spiritually. So how do I worship when I don't feel like it? You know, how do I, how do I worship God when I just don't feel the joy? And if you struggle with this, you know what I'm talking about. And I ask you a question, a question I ask myself. Do you feel like a hypocrite to praise God without joy? Do you praise him and you don't feel like it? Do you ever say, you know what, I just feel like I'm being a hypocrite? By the way, this is helpful. Hypocrites don't ask those questions. <laughs> they don't ask those questions. Richard Baxter, who was a Puritan pastor who wrote extensively on depression because Christians struggle with depression then too. Says this, Thanksgiving stirs up Thanksgiving. So what is he saying? He is saying, when we read a psalm with our mind, it stirs the affections in our heart. Even when we don't feel like it. <laughs> this is the tool that's in our toolbox. It's, a, it's the it's the tools that we put in our backpack that we pull from we worship when we are depressed we worship with music and we worship with scripture these things must be in there for our journey so here's the connection that Peter has given us he calls it inexpressible joy he's saying that when we Practice these things, these things that we sometimes don't feel like. When, when, we, when we worship, when we use scripture, when we trust in the promises of God that we're going to talk about, we get glimpses of God's glory in the midst of the pouring rain. He calls it inexpressible joy. This is what the resurrected life gives us. Inexpressible joy. Verse 6, and this you rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. I love that. Just, just take that in for a minute. Because it says, in this you rejoice. Now a little English moment, because I, I do this all the time. You ever write a sentence when you're writing a paper and you write something, and then you say, this is not a good thing, or something. You say it, and you check it in your, I got Grammarly to help me with my bad grammar. And you know what? It always underlines it. You know what it says about this? It's unclear. What is this? We asked a question. Look at the text. In this you rejoice. Underline this. What is this? This is your salvation. You're rejoicing in the midst of trials that there is something that can't be changed. You have present joy. But look at it. This is true. This is real. The Bible is real. At the same time, you, have, you are grieved by various challenges. You see that word grieve? You know what that means? Sad. <laughs> now think about this. In your life, at the same time, you can have rejoicing and sadness. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, crushed, but not destroyed. Exist. This is the Christian life. We rejoice in our salvation in the midst of depression and President Child, how can we do this? Let me just show you this here, and I hope this is helpful. That's why he's got in this you rejoice there. We experience inexpressible joy as we realize who we are and what depression can never take away. It can do what it does, but there is some things that it cannot do. It cannot do, it cannot take away that I am who I am because of what Christ has done. It cannot take that away. You see, there are some, some things that cancer, criticism, nor depression can take away from you is who you are in Christ. And that's only true because he's alive. Pastor, you don't know what I've done in my past. Can I ask you a question? Did you persecute people? 
Did you murder Christians in your past? Because Paul did. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, here's what he says. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. Paul was a murderer and a persecutor of Christians. Yet by the grace of God, he, could, he did not say, I still am what I was. He said, I am what I am by the grace of God. Are you depressed today? Because you're still living. I still am what I was. Or I am what someone told me I was. You are who you are because Jesus Christ is alive and He has spoken what you are. This is the Christian life. Listen, I don't care what someone has said to you. Unless they rose from the dead, Jesus Christ gets the last word in your life. That's what we must put in our backpack and pull out in the midst of it. Promises bring present rejoicing. That verse 6 is tied to verse 3. You are born again. Look at verse 9. He says, you obtained the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That's tied to verse 4, which is your inheritance. Full and final salvation in the presence of God. But one of my concerns and one of your concerns is how do we help our friends and our spouses when sometimes they can hardly get out of bed? Well, can I give you something that I have experienced and you probably have too? And just let us warn ourselves not to do this. Let's let's learn first what not to do to help people who struggle with depression. When someone enters into a sacred trust with you and they say, I'm struggling with fill in the blank. It may not be depression. It may be addiction of some kind. But let's say they lay before you that they struggle with this. And then you later on throw it up in their face to use it as a means of control. You have betrayed their trust and you have made it worse for them, not better. So the best way we can be friends to those who struggle with depression is to be a true friend. (laughs) If there's one thing that 26 years of marriage is beginning to teach me is sometimes my wife just needs me to shut up and be there. You can't fix it. I hate that, but you can't. My old Sunday school teacher told me, you just at that point need to be Jesus with skin on. You just need to be there. You just need to say, I love you, period. Whether you look good, whether you feel good, whether you feel it or not, I do. Richard Baxter, again, quoting from him, and I'm going to post on... On as resources, some resources I found helpful for depression. One of these resources is uh, John Piper's book, When the Darkness Will Not Lift. I know you can't see that from here, um, but we'll post that for you. He's, he's quoting Richard Baxter. There's a reason I'm quoting him, because I read a good book on depression that he quoted Richard Baxter. He says this about how you can help your friends. Even if your friend can't get out of bed, if they can't read scripture or anything else, not even a devotional, read to them. It's good advice. Be there for them. We experience inexpressible joy as we realize who we are and what depression can never take away. But here's what else, and this is, this is Peter's point today in his text. We experience inexpressible joy as we realize our depression And our struggles is not pointless because it feels pointless when you're going through it. How do I fight for joy in the midst of depression? Look at verse 7. It says, so that. He's fixing to tell you a purpose or the point here when you see that in the Bible. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes through it, is tested by fire may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So that is God's purpose for you as Christians. God is proving, growing, cultivating your personal faith. The faith does not change, but your faith and my faith does. It ebbs and flows. And when you're struggling with anxiety and depression, your personal faith is at an all-time low. That's why you can come alongside people who are struggling. Here's what he's doing. He's growing your faith. He's proving it. He's proving the validity of it. 
Those who have struggled with it for years know this is true. I think about my brother. He's sitting in here today. He said most growth is forced growth. That's true. That's what this text is telling us today. <laughs> I'm not saying that we like it. I'm not saying that it's painful and needed a scripture. He's telling you it's not going away. I'm not giving you an opium to opiate this morning. I'm giving you truth and tools to use it. God is saying he's doing this for our good and his glory. And some of that which we experience will not be realized till later. And sometimes eternity. Romans 8.28 says this, and this is only true if you're in Christ. And we know that all things who love God, who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, when Christ returns, our faith will be tried, proved, and true. He's got a purpose for what he's doing. How do I fight for it? What, we, what have we said? What do we need to have in our backpacks? We worship whether we feel like it or not. We do that through music and through scripture and through our friends and family. We take God's word and his promises and we cling to them and we meditate on them. So this is what I want to give you a couple of things now. A couple of things that, that I use. A, a, a process, a method, if you will, that, that I use in the midst of this. We take God's word and his promises and we cling to them. That means we need to find the promises of God. I mean, we need to know them when we can't concentrate when you're in depression and when anxiety takes over you can't think clearly so in that case have you prepared have you put in your backpack what's necessary in that moment when it's unclear where do you go we have to have a place that has the promises of God for us when our mind is unclear for me, I have a book by Charles Spurgeon. It's called The Checkbook. Let me make sure I get the name of it right. The Checkbook of the Bank of Faith. It's just a devotional. But it's got the promises of God every day. And when I cannot concentrate or think clearly, that's on my bookshelf right in front of me. And I pull it out. It gives me a, a passage of scripture that where I can read the promises of God and meditate on that. Here's what else you need to do if you struggle. And even if you don't, if you say you don't, you may need to look at yourself a little bit clearer. You need to get an audio Bible on your app and phone. Listen, if you can drive a car and not kill people, you can figure out how to put an app on your phone. Put an app on your phone. Put it on your computer. Get the, get, let somebody read the Bible to you when you cannot read it for yourself. Know the promises of God. Hit that button on your... If you don't know where to start, just start in Psalms. Start in the Gospel of John. Start in Ephesians. Get a passage of Scripture and meditate on it. And if, if you're taking notes, write this down. You ask yourself four things at that point. No more than four because I'm a man and that's about all I can remember. Is there a promise to believe in this passage? That's an indicative. I'm, not, I'm looking for a, something the Bible is saying, a statement of truth. Is there a promise here to believe? Is there a truth to rejoice in? Is there holiness to put on? Is there sinfulness I need to put off? Is there a promise to believe in this passage? Is there a truth to rejoice in in this passage? Is there, is there a holiness, something I need to put on? And is there something this scripture is revealing that I need to put off? You see, the indicatives in scripture always lead us to imperatives. Even, especially when we are depressed. Fighting for hope and joy begins right here. It begins in your mind. We can in the midst of our joy, in the, midst, in the midst of our depression, at that moment, at that moment, by putting, practicing that, experience the glory of God, the glimpse, the sunrise in the midst of our depression. So let's practice it, okay? So you've got your Bible. Turn with me to Lamentation. Lamentation. Y'all, you know where that is? Sometimes we don't go to that book very often. Lamentation. Find your big books of the Bible. Isaiah, 
Jeremiah. You'll find it. Lamentation 3. Lamentations 3. I want you, this is, if you don't know this passage, you, you need to know it. This is one of your verses. As you, as you look for that, Lamentation chapter 3, I was reminded in our growth group this week as someone who works at, in harm's way for our benefit says she posts scripture all over the place to keep her attention focused. That's what we're talking about today. Lamentation 3, verse 22. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good for the one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. You can, in the midst of your depression, if you find passages like this, and if you can't read them for yourself, you get your Bible or your phone to read it for you. And then you ask yourself these questions. When I look at that passage, is there a promise to believe here? When I read this, in the midst of my own personal struggle, I read this truth. God will never stop loving me. It's good news. His love is steadfast. You see it? Never stops. God don't take a nap. He don't fall down on the job. He doesn't get mad because you didn't do something right and not loving you this week. He's steadfast. He will never, look at that, he will never stop showing mercy to me. I am his. I am his family. By the way, some of you need to repent because you're not loving your family and displaying Jesus like you should. I don't know who that's for, but that's for somebody. He will never stop showing mercy to me. He's alive. He is mine. He is my portion. You see that? You know what that means? He is my inheritance. That's what that means. It's my reward. This was the spoils when someone took over a country. They divided the portion. He's my everything. Promised it to me. What's the truth in that? He's faithful. Do you see that? The Lord is just not faithful. He is faithfulness. He's good, verse 25. He's the Savior, verse 26. What can I put on here as I struggle? Verse 25, I need to wait for Him. You go back to 1 Peter, you see the same thing. This is a season and it will pass. I need to wait for him. I need to, in the midst of it, look at verse 25. I need to seek him. I need to seek him. I need to be quiet and listen. Verse 26. I need to quit being so busy. That's just an opiate. Just mask the fact that you're, that you're miserable. You need to be quiet and listen. There's something to put off here. Is there sinfulness to put off? Well, just look at the opposite. I have to put off hopeless apathy, and that's really hard when you're, at, when you're anxious. And I need to put off loud impatience. I hope you find that helpful, brothers and sisters. This is simply practical Christianity. It does no good for me to sit here and preach the Word if I don't tell you how to practice it. This is what you need to put in your backpack when you go through the journey of your life. This must be part of your every single day. So how can you help someone else? This is one of the most important verses to me as your pastor. This is one of the reasons that that we are here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. Paul writes to the local church. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you had become very dear to us. How can you help someone who struggles with depression? What does the text say? Give them the gospel and give them you. This is what we do. Don't just give them you. You are not enough. The gospel is enough. But as Paul Tripp says, we are instruments in the Redeemer's hands. We bring the gospel and we must bring it in a love, an abiding love. 
A love that has already proven herself before the storm comes. Give them the gospel and give them you. So in our last few minutes together, what can we take away from this today? Sort of the application of the application. Depression is not pointless, but it's painful. And if you don't struggle with it, don't be arrogant against those who do. Depression is not pointless, but it's painful. We fight depression as we live by faith. Trusting the Lord to perfect our faith. This means that we do this through worship that centers on thanksgiving and praise. We take God's promises and we meditate them day by day, second by second. We wring it out for the truth and the promises. But what do you do when you're hiking along your trail? Okay, I've got those things, Pastor. <laughs> They're in there. And I'm hiking along my trail, and there is an obstacle in my trail I wasn't expecting. What might some of those obstacles be today? I don't want to get into them. I just want to make you aware of them. Depression is often impacted by my personality and temperament. Personally, I I know that nature helps me because of my personality and temperament. I, I normally go outside. I get near nature. I know that about myself. If I stay in a little small closed up room, it's not good for me. Depression is affected by my personality and my own temperament. I am aware of that. Are you aware of yours? Depression is part of spiritual warfare as a believer. We are attacked. The church in in Asia Minor was being, people were being attacked precisely because they were different. And they were Christians. Spiritual warfare is part of that. Depression is often due to misplaced trust. Misplaced trust. It is that we have sought to be comforted in the midst of our anxiety through relationships and careers. And they have been found wanting. We do not have faith in people nor our own faith nor our future career. We have faith in Jesus Christ. And all over the world with people who have virtually nothing. He's enough. Depression is often due to misplaced priorities. This means you need to manage your expectations. You need to manage the expectations that you receive from other people. And listen, I've said this a thousand times, and it is almost always rejected by those who struggle with depression. Depression is always made worse by isolation, but yet it's our first response. We isolate to self-protect ourselves, and this always makes it worse. But listen, I want you to hear this even more today. Because this involves many of us, most of us. Depression is often made worse due to guilt, shame, and trauma. We are, many of us, like Christian in Pilgrim's Progress, carrying a burden that Christ died to remove. And that's probably you today. It could be sin done by you, and it could be sin done to you. This makes depression worse. So I ask a question during this tough time. Has the trauma of a past event come up in your mind? Has it rekindled raw as it was when it happens? This means that that trauma in the past most likely has never been dealt with. What can we do if these things are true? Pastor, you need to get good biblical counseling. And you said, well, pastor, you say you struggle with this. Have you been to counseling? Yes, I have. And if I need it again, I will go to it again. You are not always the answer to your own problem. You need someone objectively to speak truth into your life. Get the help you need. Get not only a good practices individually, This is true today. Depression cannot be defeated without three things. Godly grief. If someone has hurt you, if someone has damaged you, if someone has sinned against you, you need to be able to grieve over that. It's not okay. 
But while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You need to, go th- you need to experience a godly grief over things. But you also need to experience genuine forgiveness. Not only forgiveness in Christ for your sins, but you need to forgive other people's. As a good counselor told me, put them on God, God's hook. Put them on God's hook. Christ forgave you. Forgive. And we need to have gospel hope. What is gospel hope? Do you have gospel hope? I give you this morning what I also received. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried according to the scriptures. But he rose again. So as we close, let us go to 2 Corinthians. We'll close with this. Hopefully this is both an encouragement. I'm also giving you some of my uh, go-to verses. <laughs> Second Corinthians 4. Look at verse 16. We'll close with this and then we'll pray. Second Corinthians 4 verse 16 says this. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer selves is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen, eternal. Let's pray together. Lord, we have heard from your word, and we thank you that your word is honest, is true, is real. That it gives us a living hope through the person of Christ. And so we thank you for the precious treasure of your word that reveals who you are. It reveals to us not only who you are, but who we are in you cause of the work of your son and so now Lord as we are all in different places in our homes and and separated Lord I don't know what's going on in the minds and emotions and many of us are pretty good at hiding it Lord some of us need to talk to our spouses after this is over some of us need to call some biblical counselors when when this is over Some of us need to get some help, Lord. And so I pray today that you will take these truths, these principles, these practices. You will put them into the work and into the lives of your people. And Lord, there is someone here that is hearing me now. That you would give them gospel hope. Through your son, Jesus Christ. For he is all of our hope. And now, Lord. We want to respond. We want to respond in worship. We want to respond in prayer. We want to respond in generosity. Receive our worship. Our Father. Through the Lord Jesus Christ. And in whose name we pray. And by whose power we live. His name is Jesus. Amen.